여러분 안녕하십니까? 반갑습니다. Uh, I want to thank uh, 회장님 for her invitation. And today's talk is commemorating our Buddha's birthday soon to come. And the title is Thus I Have Heard. Everybody remembers when you read the sutras, you read it in Korean and Chinese. I used to read it in English and Hungarian. At the beginning, when Ananda or Suputi or other students, they recount the Buddha's words, they say, thus I have heard. So what did they actually hear? You may say, look into the book, because in the book you read the Buddha's words. And that's what these uh, very sincere and faithful disciples heard. That is true. That is correct, and we should read them as the Buddha's words, although if you look at it very carefully, you see that it is very structured. It has logic. It has very clear beginning and end. It has many repetitions. In fact, it has so many repetitions with various subjects involved that it doesn't even resemble a human being's natural style. You can hear many teachers, and those teachers, they speak to you live with living words. And when you read the sutras, it doesn't strike you as something which a natural person, somebody living, would use as a manner of speech. Why is that? We are living now in the 21st century and Korea has a long history, not just going back to the Shilla dynasty, but way before, before, before that. In fact, I came upon a book called 5,000 Years of Korean History. Now, when you read those history books, what do you read? You read something that historians wrote down, just like a few hundred years after the Buddha's Nirvana, they started to write down what the Buddha said. But they didn't write it down in the Buddha's lifetime. They wrote it down a long time after he passed into Nirvana. When you read history, or you see the KBS historical drama, you know, with these very interesting Confucian hats and lots of warriors and very fair ladies in the royal court and a lot of blood and treason and betrayal and alliance. We think that's history. When you read the sutras, we think that's the Buddha's words. But is that his real teaching? Is that what he wanted to transmit to us? And we can say that at first, it is true that's something that we have to pass if we want to become the Buddha's disciples. Likewise, we have to pass the gates of history by reading the books or these days watching those sequences of dramas and movies that are about our history. But just like I know about Hungarian history differently, you know about your own history differently. And if you just resort to the means of preservation, you don't come to the source of that history. It's very easy to see. When we look at people who lived through the Korean War, they will tell you very different stories from the official history books and the official museums. You still have Hanaboji and Harmony somewhere in the village or in a small apartment in Seoul who lived through the Korean War. And what they tell you and what you get in your books and television, they are drastically different. Why? Because they lived through it. It's their direct experience. And not something for government or education or entertainment. And the difference is just 60 years. Exactly 60 years ago, the Korean War ended. And you see and hear that those who went through it, they tell you drastically different stories from what you read and see and watch in the media and in the books. It does not mean that either of them is untrue. 
What this means is that the rendering of history is different when it's handed down by generations or you live it with your own true personal experience. If you say one is true or the other is not, that's a mistake. But we should recognize the difference between direct experience and indirect transmission. And the same is true with the Buddha's words and his teaching and his mind and our minds. So when you observe the difference in 60 years, how much more is that in 1600 years? 1600 years ago in the Shila dynasty, the Dharma came to Korea. What kind of Dharma was that? You know? It was even before Henning Sunyu, the sixth patriarch. Through China, through the northern transmission line, the Dharma started to come to Korea 16, 1700 years ago. We don't know exactly when, because the monk who brought it first from China did not have a visa stamp in his passport. In fact, he probably never had a passport. And there was no border check of this kind that we have now with cameras and stamps and computers and quarantines. So what actually happened, we don't know. But what we know that it resulted in the Dharma currently practiced in Korea in the present day. What we know is that whatever Suputi, Ananda, Mahamogalana and other disciples heard resulted in the Dharma in the 21st century today. So that's a historical view that actually helps you keep one mind and see the line of cause and effect correctly and directly instead of being lost in various versions of history. You look at the difference, the seeming difference between Nambang Bulgyo and Desim Bulgyo, between Theravada and Mahayana, the way they present the Buddha's life is very different. The way they think about the sutras is very different. The way they present the line of transmission from Buddhas and patriarchs is very different. And if we get stuck in those differences, we lose the original Dharma. We lose the original teaching. So you can say, yeah, thus I have heard. But how did I see that? How did I experience that? How did I go back to the original place where that teaching came from? So this is really important. Because if we are attached to the words, we will get stuck at the sutra level. We will get stuck at the history books. And we will never listen to the true teaching of what we call living transmission. When we come every morning to our working place, whether it is this wonderful university or some other place in town, do we start our day with the sentence, thus I have heard. No, we don't say that. But we say what we saw in the news, what our parents or friends or family members have told us. So we use this instinctively to share. To share something that is important for us. My mother told me this, you know, you know. My father told me this, you know. My brother and sister, you know, they are in such a good mood or bad mood because they told me this and this and this. Or I heard this in the news. I saw this on television. We don't say thus I have heard, but we are using the same means of transmitting information from one place to another. So in the Buddha's time, there was no recording. There were no smartphones, computers, cameras, portable recorders. I wonder what he would have done with them. <laughs> how the Dharma would have progressed if we had retrieval devices in his time. And we could have actually recorded the way that he spoke. Just like I would be very interested to be in present in the Middle East 2,000 years ago, I would have loved to be in Northern India 2,550 years ago, and a little more. Because our Lord Buddha, he was teaching for 45 years. And those 45 years, wow! What a difference they made for the rest of our historical era to the present day. 
So what could we have heard? What did he actually say? And right here, right now, we can say with 100% certainty that we will never know. It's the first don't know experience. And we are very far from Zen yet, or Son Gyo. But we know certainly that we will never know what the words actually were from his mouth because we never heard them. And those who heard them wrote them down about 400 years later in its final form with the Pali Canon. And that's it. And if in 60 years your forefather's story and the official historical story of the sad and tragic war of the separation between the two Koreas could become so drastically different, what would be the difference between the Buddha's original time and 400 years later? Well, fortunately, in the Buddha's case, there were people with very clear, sharp and retentive memory like Ananda. Ananda was better than this because <laughs> this little device can have about a day or two and then you have to recharge it. Well, Ananda only had to eat and sleep and practice and he was fully functional for a long, long time. He had no batteries to be exhausted. Yeah, sometimes we get tired. But when the Buddha was awake and doing his job, then so was Ananda, his attendant. So his memory was very good. But after the Buddha's passing, when they wanted to establish the official lines of teaching, what he actually said, Ananda was not allowed into the assembly of Arahans because he had not attained Arahanhood or being an enlightened, fully enlightened person. So Mahakashyapa, he said to him, if you can come in, through that door, without touching the doorknob or touching whatever they use for opening, then you can come in. If not, you're not yet free from your own bondage. So Ananda looked at the door and said, I cannot come in without touching the door. So I must go and practice. So he went up to the mountains and he practiced very hard for one week. One week. And that one week, Supposedly, he was standing on his toes. On his toes. It was an old Brahmin ascetic practice from the Hindu tradition. That you're standing very stiff and your body doesn't move and soon your mind doesn't move and attains this elevated state. Either the union with some higher God or in the Buddha's disciples case, enlightenment. So reportedly Ananda was standing on his toes for most of that one week and never slept and he didn't eat. Only wanted to get enlightenment. And then he comes down from the mountain after one week and goes straight into the room and they accepted him. We also don't know whether he touched the door or not. By then his mind must have been very clear. So touching, no touching the door is not in the story. But what we know that he could serve as the official repository for the Buddha's teaching and thus we could read what he heard. The way it was put into writing, like I've said, is significant of the Hindu technique of memorizing the Vedas, the Upanishads and all these sacred texts that they had and they still have. So the Buddha was talking about the subject then the whole paragraph was finished and they took out the meaningful part and put another meaningful part into it and they repeated the whole thing again. And that's why if you read the long version of the Heart Sutra, then there is a lot more to say, but it repeats in the same way as we repeat the first part. So the same is true of forms, feelings, perceptions, impulses, consciousness. We don't recite the whole thing again with the five skandhas. We just say the same is true about them. Likewise, when we talk about no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no realm of eyes, no realm of mind consciousness, it's a short repetition because we don't repeat the whole sutra with all these new objects of thought. But in the old days, they did. They had nothing else to do. They became monks, they went for their alms in the morning, 
Then they came back, they studied, then they ate, then they studied in the afternoon, then they meditated, and that's it. So they repeated these things over and over again. Like in your Confucianist, Taoist, Buddhist, and uh, now Western-influenced culture, you are used to repeating things a lot more than we are used to in the West. So still, in your school system, at least until the end of your high school, the good student is the one who repeats everything in the way he or she was taught. Creativity comes second. I was in a school system that was matching half-half. Looking back at it, I think I was taught to repeat things and to create things to be submissive and to be critical with equal force. Since uh, my high school time was in the socialist times and uh, my university time ended in the democratic you know, era, I could experience the transition. And these days, many people in the West, they are extremely creative, but they didn't do their homework. So they don't know their own tools. They didn't acquire their own means to be creative. And in the old days, especially in Asia, people knew so much, but their knowledge was static because they did not get the encouragement to be, to be creative, to make something new, because especially in Confucianism, you are supposed to carry on the heritage from your ancestors, from your father, mother, grandfather, grandmother. And if you look at the history of a Confucianist country, like Korea is the last standing Confucianist country on earth, because every, everything else just changed so radically, that Korea has the last built-in Confucianist tradition in its culture. But Korea has the built-in repeat, 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 repeat. Because thus I have heard from my father, mother, teacher, etc., etc. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if we see that, then we have a job. Just like we have a job if we attain the Buddha's teaching by words, by the recordings, we might feel encouraged to attain its source, to attain the Buddha's mind, to attain the source where that teaching came from. Likewise, when we attain our own culture by learning it, by repeating it, we have to try and attain that source where that culture comes from, where that history comes from, the mind that makes it all. And that's not just an individual mind, it's a group, it's a society, it's a culture, it's a civilization. And once you enter the present moment with this clear mind, and you associate with people who do the same, you can experience your own creativity. Not just repeat what was handed down by the elders, but experience how you create it, recreate it, and renew it. That's human. That's natural. How did we see that throughout the history of Buddhism? We could see it from time to time when great figures like Dharma Desa or Bodhidharma or Henning Sunim or Sosan Desa or Wonhyo Sunim or Zen masters of late, they appeared and they repeated something from the old. Even the Buddha repeated something from the old but they drastically renewed the way we looked at it currently. We have the same human situation. Ever since we have known ourselves as species, as humans, we have the same situation of being born, growing up, getting old, and dying. We come, we do something, we go. It's the same situation all over again and again and again. We repeat it. But the way we look at it from time to time, throughout history, has changed very radically. So the way we think about ourselves, with all our scientific results, with all our religious beliefs, with all our experience in the last 3,000 years as human beings, the way we think ourselves now, and the way we used to think ourselves a thousand years ago in Europe or in Asia, they are like two different worlds. Very, very different. But you can draw a distinct line between them, a thousand years ago and now. 
what a human being was supposed to be in the eyes of the living and what we are supposed to be now in the eyes of the living as humans. The views are very different. So if you look at our way, our true self, our potential for enlightenment, our practice, in the Buddha's time the view was very different. But our situation as human beings was pretty much the same. But we look at society differently. We look at our way differently because from time to time there were people who renewed our view. So that kind of renewal, that kind of recreation, balances out the repetition. Okay? You cannot infinitely repeat something because it stops being relevant. But if you don't join the line, especially the mind lineage, then you also become an outsider or irrelevant. Irrelevant means cannot solve problems, cannot answer questions, cannot be useful, cannot go on the transcendental path in our case. But for you yourself, all of you, you have to see how much you have to repeat and you have to have this Hashim or Argesnida and I will do it, do it, do it without thinking and how much you have to renew. How much you have to freshly recreate something in this moment? How much you have to ask this question again, what am I? It always gives you seemingly a different answer, but it's always the same thing inside which asks that question. Okay? So the balance, the harmony between the old and the new, the repeated and the created, that's something that you can never hear but you can discover. You can hear part of it. But you have to really discover inside what you truly are. And when you do that, you are not only refreshed and renewed, but you have a new view on the world as well as yourself. If you don't change the view on yourself, you can never look at your relationships or the world, your problems or your, or your solutions differently. And that's why you have to change your view. You have to recreate your cl clarity. You have to return to that. So, what did you really hear today? Please don't repeat it. Go to the source of it. Go to the origin of that. Just like a child who loves chocolate, and she loves many kinds of sweets, but ultimately, where does sugar become sweet? Do you know that? Does chocolate become sweet in the factory? Does it become sweet in Brazil or anywhere in South America where the cocoa is produced? Does it become sweet when the sugar cane renders the syrup and it becomes sugar? Does it become sweet when it's packaged because it looks so good? Does it become sweet when you see that oh, chocolate? When does sugar or chocolate become sweet? So when exactly is the Buddha born? Was he born 2,557 years ago? Has he died? Yeah, his body was born and his body died. But the Buddha mind is it born? Does it die? Can it be repeated? Can it be heard? Can it be handed down? Can it be transmitted? These questions are the sweet scent of a fresh wind in your consciousness. Do not take words for granted. Also do not discredit them or disbelieve them. Put words where they belong to the realm of books, libraries, and intellectual knowledge. And as we know from our whole being, intellectual knowledge is just a very small segment, a necessary segment, and it's neither good nor bad, but it's very limited. When you use a fishing net, what can you do with it? You can catch fish, right? When you use your thinking, you can get some wisdom, right? When you use your feelings correctly, you can exercise some empathy and maybe some sympathy. 
but if you have a fishing net and the fishing net only, can you catch the sea? If you are only thinking, can you encompass and attain reality itself completely? If you only use your emotions, can you become one with the universe? So remember these questions and use these questions to go through the gate of no thinking, no words, no speech, no sounds, no thoughts, no realm of eyes. And when you do that, you enter the mind from where the Buddha's teaching was born. You enter the factory which makes 10,000 sweets. And then you do yourself and your grandmother and grandfather, all your ancestors and your descendants a great favor. Because just like you repeated something from before, our descendants will definitely repeat something from us. What will that be? And now if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, I'm I'm afraid of a uh, failure, so I avoid the uh, important opportunity in my life. Uh, consequently, uh, I lost a uh, goal, and I don't know what I have to do and what I want to become in my life. How can I overcome this situation? Thank you for your wonderful question. <laughs> <laughs> if you know that you have an important decision to make, and you have to make that decision, but you don't make it, have you not failed already? If you look at it very clearly, we are on a schedule. We are born, we grow up, we do something, we get old, and we die. Time does not stop. Time will never stop. Time has one dimension only. In simple term, we can say forward. Space has three dimensions. If two-dimensional traffic is too slow, you can take a helicopter or an airplane and fly. You can use the third dimension as well. But in time, you have only one. We call that impermanence. And human beings' number one mistake is that we, A, don't know what it is, B, we don't take it seriously, three, we don't use it correctly. So if we knew what it really was, we would take it very seriously. And then once we have taken it seriously, we could use it correctly. Imagine that every decision you make either helps or hinders you becoming a mother and a wife. Then your decision making will be very easy. Because you feel it not just in your head, also in your heart, in your bones, in your cells, everywhere in your body, that what you do either contributes to the purpose or distracts you from the purpose why you were born. That's why you need to find it out very quickly what is the purpose of your life. And there will be many answers, many small answers, like you want to do this, you want to be with this person, you want to live here, you want to do this job, etc., etc., etc. But we say if a critical mass does not become clear for you, then your character does not have the integrity, and I'm not talking about moral or ethical integrity here, but the integrity within yourself, that you would know what you want to do. You would feel what is right for you. You would perceive who you want to be with. So if you cannot make a decision, that means you do not have a direction, because you do not have a motivation. And once you know, what kind of situation we are in. Once you see inside why you were born, once you know what you want to do and you want to be with etc. 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 
then you can make those decisions you could never even dream of. Easily, simply, clearly. Because your view changes. If the first view is that we live for ourselves, it's inevitable. When the kid grows up, as children, we have needs, we have desires, we have aversions, we have a very individualistic view. Even if you are raised in a group society like Korea, the little ego, the little individual necessarily arises. There is no way around it. And then you realize that it's not just me who I am living for. So how much you want to open up that scope? How many people you are actually living for if it's not just yourself? Many people, oh, I live for my family. Yeah, that's wonderful. How many of your family members? Just your spouse and children and parents or also maybe your cousins, your side relatives, uh, your in-laws? How many? Or if you choose to live for more, then how you relate to them, those that are not in your flesh and blood family. And I'm just talking about relationships, not about goals in your life. So, in this case, the Huadu is not what am I or what is this. The Huadu is what is my job? Or why was I born? What is my job is a little bit more creative. Why was I born can be a little bit melancholic, you know. Oh, why was I born? <laughs> no. So ask yourself the right question and you will get the right answer. If you ask yourself only, why can't I make these decisions? That question is not good, not bad. It just doesn't go deep enough. Right? It doesn't go deep enough because you get some kind of intellectual answer or some feeling answer, but it doesn't lead you deep. So if you ask a deep question, you'll get a very deep answer. That's why I suggest you ask a different question, but the big question solves the small questions. Never forget that. Okay, so the lion goes into the jungle and all the small animals say, yes, your majesty. So the other problems between the animals are suddenly solved, at least for a short time. So if you have some kind of a thinking problem, feeling problem, many small questions, bring in the big one. One big question takes care of the rest. Okay? Better? Okay. More questions? 저는 새 자녀를 둔 엄마인데요. 그 지금 이제 사춘기를 겪는 시, 어, 애들 사춘기 애들하고 그 다음에 남편하고의 이 관계가 오히려 이제 타인들보다도 더 상처를 받고 좀 힘든데 그건 어떻게 극복을 해야 되는지 좋은 말씀 부탁드리겠습니다. Boy or girl? Girl. You're lucky. It's your job, not your husband's job. How old is she? Yes, I am. Your yodel? <laughs> That's not an adolescent. That your yodel, Sario? That's eighteen. Your Hana, two, seven, eight. That's not even yodel. Your yodel. How good? She's eighteen years. She's not adolescent anymore. Adolescent means thirteen, fourteen. She's eighteen years old. Most of this kind of problem comes from. Uh, emotions. This kind of relationship problem you mentioned comes from emotions. And you as a mother will not solve most of these emotional problems, but her boyfriend will. <laughs> so your job as a young mother, because your body age very young, is to advise her how to pick the right boyfriend. She will not follow that. 
But without your advice, she would make a much worse choice. So she will take some of your words into consideration, and most of it she will not. She's 18, she wants to become a young woman. And with this generation X, she wants to be as independent as possible. So, first of all, as a mother, you have two jobs. One is to reassure her that you are on her side. I know it sounds strange, but it's not self-evident. Sometimes children, they feel antagonized from the uh, parent of the same gender, like I did with my father. Because instinctively I competed with him. I wanted to be better than him. I wanted to be more far-reaching, more clever, more influential, etc., etc., in my own way. So I listened to his speech, but I followed maybe 5%, but it turned out to be, at least for me, the most important 5%. So you're lucky. It's your daughter. If it, if it was a boy, then the father would have to wrestle a little bit, you know? <laughs> and uh, see where she can improve. If you want her to repeat what you teach her, she will never do that. What you can help her do is recreate it in her own way, with your education and teaching and care and concern as a mother built in. She will build it in if you let her do it yourself. Okay? So, the relationship problem can be fixed with two things. Freedom and loyalty. If you give her enough freedom, she will be loyal to you. But this kind of loyalty cannot be commanded by some social tradition only. It's deep in our hearts. If it's not rooted in our true feelings, true sentiments, true appreciation and gratitude towards our parents or spiritual forefathers, then it just becomes a form. And this form tells you that you reunite with your family at least once a year, chuso. That's it. Or maybe birthdays. But other than that, you just smile, but deep inside you feel estranged from your parents because in the most important moment, they didn't help you. You couldn't trust them. You couldn't depend on them because they had a small mind and wanted to capture you even when you were about to start your own life, which is at age 18, at least emotionally, physically, if not financially, but it's starting, even if she goes to university. Okay? So prepare her for her freedom and she will respond with loyalty to you. You will not lose her. If you're attached to her, you lost her already. So prepare your daughter for her own freedom. There's a lot of things she doesn't know. She believes she knows. That's her mistake. She believes she is a woman already. It's true, maybe physically, but emotionally and mentally. Is she mature? Hardly. Nobody at age 18 knows as much about the world and themselves and the society as they know 10 years later when they are 28. And they can suffer a lot of damage until then because they make mistakes. You can prevent most of them. But only if you use your maternal influence to help her prepare for her freedom. Then you earn her loyalty. If not, she will break free the moment she can and she will see you out of her duty as a daughter and not as her love for her mother. So you can do a lot to preserve that because then she will become a very good mother herself. Whether we like it or not, our parents are the models for the roles that we take later in life. And if she becomes a mother, she will inevitably follow you, whether she likes it or not. She will change, of course, but how deep that change goes depends on the sincerity of the education and teaching that you give her. So you give her a deeply enlightening mother's teaching to daughter, then she will carry that forward. So be careful what you teach her. And it's not just the words that she hears that will teach her. Your feelings, your actions, they will teach a lot more. Especially your feelings. 
If you have a wide open loving mind towards your daughter, she will take refuge in that whether she knows it or not. But if you keep your mind closed and you say only my way, then she will reject that. As long as she must, she follows. But after that, she's gone. And you can see a lot of that in Asia these days. We call that broken families and broken hearts. Because they repeat the mistake later. So your advantage is that you are a generation older than your daughter. You have a lot more experience. You went through a lot more in this human life. So teach your daughter what she doesn't seem to know, but she needs it. And how can you do that? You answer her questions. Let her ask you. Let her have questions. And if she doesn't, watch for the problems that will come. And stand by with the band-aid. She will get burnt. She'll come back home unhappy. And then from a completely clear mind, without any judgments, without any expectations, you can teach her. You can help her. And then she will trust you. So this kind of open-minded, open-ended, non-judgmental, non-expecting relationship, this has an effect that we cannot overestimate. Many times we underestimate it. Many times we don't believe in it because we don't believe in ourselves so much. We don't believe we can be like that. And most of the time, by the time we are ready to do this, we have wasted some of our lifetime. We have wasted 5-10 years. We have wasted a few relationships. And deep inside, you already know how you want to do it. But our conditioned fears, they are many times stronger than our true nature, which constantly sends the signals, moment to moment. Our Buddha nature never stops working and, and operating. So do we truly listen? Do we truly perceive? Do we truly see? what we are supposed to do as human beings, it's all in us already. Any external teaching can only take away the hindrances. But it will never give you the independence that everybody wants. It never gives you the self-reliance, what your daughter wants. But if you teach her that, if you let her have her freedom with the wisdom and compassion, then, and only then, she will trust you, respect you, and eventually come back to you. Okay. More questions? My question is about thanks for everything. In my friend, many of them, they, they say thanks for everything, but I don't know how can I thanks for everything because I don't, I don't like this or, or I don't I like this or I this I don't like this so I don't how can I have to thanks for everything so this uh, appreciation for everything or thanking everything if you just try that as a machine that every morning you press this button Thank for everything. <laughs> then in the evening, thanks for everything. Then thanks for everything, thanks for everything, becomes meaningless. And deep inside, underneath, you feel that you really hate something or hate somebody. And if you could kill, you could. But of course, your Buddha nature holds you back. And your good Buddhist teaching, which you receive, says, no, 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 it's a bad cause. But deep inside, once it is in <laughs> so, I'll get him or I'll get her, you know, this kind of stuff. So, how should we really begin the appreciation if we want to appreciate? First of all, is there something that we should really be thankful for? Is there really something that we can genuinely thank? Because if we see this life, that life can be happiness, but it is many times suffering. Sometimes we are not really thankful. 
that we were born. We should be, we say, it's kind of optimistic. But many times we are not thankful that we were born. And in a deep crisis, sometimes we wish we had never been born at all, that this kind of configuration we call ourselves would have never come about. We have to acknowledge these feelings. Or when you have an adversary who competes with you, or who always pushes you down, or somebody who is uh, abusive with his or her authority, or a younger junior who never listens to you, we cannot thank them for that. By default, by the way we are, we want to eliminate them and only focus on the happiness or pleasantries or the good things in life. That's the way we exist most of the time, right? Well, this comes from not understanding, not perceiving and not feeling how we actually live and die. So, if this has a front, it has a back. If we have good, then we also have bad. The Dhammapada, which is the short and concise teaching by the Buddha, says it very clearly. If this exists, that also exists. If that ceases to exist, then this ceases to exist as well. So, we cannot be just thankful just because there is some moralistic teaching or an ethical code or a social tradition that tell us that we should be like that. If we suppress our likes and dislikes, we will never come to terms with our own reality, the way we are. So first we have to do it in the hard way. We have to ask, what do I really feel? What do I really think? And it has a strong eye in it. It's true. But once you acknowledge that, once you see that, then you are rooted in your own reality as a self, as an ego. We have to see that. If we don't see that, we cannot transcend it. Transcendence results in spiritual independence and the freedom of the mind. Like that, it cannot be controlled just by some machinery. It cannot be commanded from the outside. You have to attain it in your own way. And many times it's the hard way. There are very few people like the Buddha only practiced six years and he got it fully, completely. He already brought down a very high class consciousness, which we mostly don't. So we have to see that. First, you want to be thankful, but you cannot be. And that's the first thing that we need to see and acknowledge. We want to be thankful. We want to feel good about somebody or our own existence, or our own ancestry, or our own history, and we cannot do that. Why? Because we think in terms of good and bad. Can we not think in terms of good and bad? Well, you can try, you can come back to the point of no thinking, and once you do that, you change your perspective. What is really important, really important, is that you see how good and bad come about, how right and wrong come about, how like and dislike come about, and it's no secret that it's created by our minds alone. So if somebody helps you overcome your dualistic feelings, dualistic thinking, and thereby eliminate the suffering of good and bad, right and wrong, that's something to be thankful for, right? That's a good start. So after that, you see that everything that contributes to this transcendental state of mind, when your mind is clear like space, clear like a mirror, uh, everything that contributes that, to that, everyone that helps that, should also be thanked, because it's beyond good and bad, right or wrong. So funnily enough, the moment you lose the distinction, the discrimination between good and bad, right and wrong, thanking and not thanking, that moment is something you have to appreciate by default, because the dilemma, the problem, the suffering is gone. Isn't that paradoxical? Isn't that interesting? But that's something we are all thankful for because the suffering is gone. 
because this constant push and pull of our right and wrong ideas is gone. So anything and anybody who contributes to that gets a little share of our appreciation. Then you open it up a little wider and there are people who really have strong ideas of good and bad, whether they like you or not. And you get two phone calls. One, Christo, I like you. Other, Christo, I really don't like you. And people express it in many ways. But you already know that it's created by their minds. So you can thank them for a different reason. They test your mind. They test your tolerance. They test your compassion. They test your insight into the true nature of this reality. And that insight is we create it for ourselves. And then you don't have to follow those ideas. And since they have tested you, and you have withstood the test, and you have found your own way by doing so, you can thank them for that. But never thank people and things like a machine. Just because somebody tells you so. Gradually, step by step, you can find ways to appreciate people. And the moment you do that, your relationship opens up and it becomes a lot more of a freedom nature than bondage nature. Why? Opposites attract each other. So if you love somebody, that person is with you for a long time. If you hate somebody, that person is also with you for a long time. Why? Because you started to relate to them in a very, very dualistic manner. And the stronger the opposites, the stronger the attraction. Right? So that's why you have to thank people. Thank you for your teaching. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for hating me. <laughs> you can say that. And that's why we can understand step by step why one of our greatest teachers is says, love your enemies. But mostly we cannot do that. Why? Because they are our enemies. So how can you love your enemy? The answer is you cannot. But once you start to have a correct relationship to them and see them for what they are, they stop being your enemies. And then you can love them. Only then. So that's why never delude yourself. Never. If you do not feel something genuinely true inside, do not follow that. Because then you deceive yourself and thereby you deceive others. Our parents, our families, our uh, society many times do not teach us beyond the norms, the accepted norms of that family or society. And many times it has a lot of things built in that we individually cannot agree with. Like, I will never follow my mother. She's a good person, but I don't want to do things in her way. You can say, I have a community around me, I have a society around me, but I don't want to do things in that way because I don't recognize that as correct. Now then be careful. Be careful where you go. Be careful what kind of direction you take. And the only way to gracefully bow out is to thank them. Otherwise your karma, your leftover relationship karma will pull you back. Either that they would apologize to you, or you would apologize to them, or that you would gain something, something from them and they would gain something from you. That we call that dualistic leftover. Something that doesn't cease because it's still on fire. There is I in it. There's egos in it. There's good and bad in it. Because we haven't thanked each other enough. We haven't said our goodbyes. And then we cannot really start something new, fresh and clear. So, being appreciative is very important. It has function. Definitely not just a form. So, at the end of the Dharma talk, I will thank everybody who had questions, but I will also thank everybody who did not have questions. Why? Because everybody was here. And everybody is still here. And the minds are open. The eyes are shining and the ears are kind of perceiving, hearing the talk, questions and answers. So that's something to be thankful for. So if you see the interrelated nature of our existence, if we see how we depend on each other, and if you see how we can cultivate our relationships, then being thankful comes very naturally.
But never take my word for granted. Never take the teachings on appreciation for granted. Discover it in your heart what it means to be thankful and what, is, what it means to be loathing or hateful or non-appreciative or ungrateful. And there are people whom you cannot thank from the bottom of your heart. Don't. Get to the point. And you can get to that point through people and events that you can truly appreciate and you can truly feel grateful for. And that will spread. Fake gratitude breaks at the most important moment. We call that lack of trust. So when you keep thanking people, but deep inside you don't feel that this is genuine, in the most important critical moment you cannot trust them, and then everything breaks. So this kind of genuine relationship, the truth, is rooted in our substance. Our substance is the same substance. But unless we really perceive that, our dualistic views and feelings and emotions, they will never ever become loose. They will never ever go away. We will never transcend them. And that's why our practice to experience our true self, our true nature, not just yours and yours, our true nature is the same true nature. It doesn't really exist in the way we think. It's not some pantheistic view like a little Buddha in everybody is the potential to wake up. But it has no name, no form, no life, no death. You say it exists, it's a mistake. You say it doesn't exist, also a mistake. You call it I, it's a mistake. You call it no I, also a mistake. But you can live it because it's this moment. And in this moment you can perceive things and people, everything as we are, without good or bad, like and dislike, gratitude or non-gratitude. And then, when you have transcended this dualistic state, you have something to be grateful for. And that can spread because it's rooted in the experience of our substance, the direct perception of our truth. Then it has correct function. Then you're not deluding yourself into some social form or some custom or habit. And then people feel that genuine sincerity from you. And guess what? They will say, thank you, Crystal, for being who you are. You can get there. Okay? Wonderful. More questions? I am 44 years old. But I still haven't met my husband yet. Why is that? Sometimes that happens. Why is that? Why is that? Now, how do you think I can help you with that? <laughs> <웃음> 질문, 질문 시작하면 네. 질문 마치야 돼요. 그래서 무슨 질문 났어요? <웃음> 어떻게 하면 결혼을 할수 있을까요? <웃음> 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 죄송해요. 스님 결혼 안 하셨는데 죄송합니다. <웃음> you see, this is the time when I cannot say I can speak of experience. But one thing I can tell you. Men are really not easy to find if you want a husband because most of the time they have some other idea about their lives. Some of them want to become husbands very quickly and easily and some of them are pretty hard to rein in. So if you want to have a quick date, a few months of uh, getting to know one another and then one day you pop the question, Honey, why don't we get married? Then most likely that this man will say, <gasps> and then runs away. <laughs> so, do you think you can be a good wife? That's why you cannot get married. Once you are absolutely sure that you are made of wife's material, you'll find a man who is made of husband's material. But if you're uncertain inside, 
whether you can be a wife or not, then why are you surprised that the world does not present you with an able-bodied man with enough intelligence to recognize that she could be a wonderful wife? Because you don't believe that inside. So have the wife inside, and then you will have the husband from the outside. Do you know what is beauty? What is beauty? <laughs> you see, that's what you think. You look into the mirror every morning, do I look beautiful? You ask yourself as a woman. Now that's not beauty, I'm sorry. Beauty is the same attraction that gravity has onto celestial objects. Beauty is the attraction that you have on a man. And it has very little to do with your facial features or the makeup. Somewhat, a little bit, but that has very little to do with it. Your gravity, your inner beauty, as a woman, does not depend on your exterior appearance more than a tree depends on just a leaf. It's your heart, your emotions, your womanhood that attracts a man. If you want to get married, be this 100% woman inside, 100% wife inside, ready to be married to the man who comes within this elliptical course of your gravity. Because men, they want to follow their path. They want to be like a comet, you know, just go straight and maybe leave a little trace behind, but that's it. Most of them are like that. But when an object with very heavy gravity appears, that changes the trajectory of the comet. So you change a man's path by, by attracting him. And it's natural, it happens every day, it happens every time, everywhere on this earth. Otherwise there would be no marriages and no kids. But you should be aware of yourself as a woman, who you are, what you represent, and how your female yin force, the gravity, can operate. And once you are aware of that, once you really become that, then like this, in your space, in your life, a man appears who responds to that. But if it's not clear within yourself, if you do not perceive and attain how to display this female attraction, then your gravitic force is disabled. Then there is no mass, there is no gravity, there is no female attractive energy. And for that you should feel attractive, you should feel a woman and you should feel a wife already inside. Can you do that? So, any other questions? Last one. 부모님이 많이 나이가 드셨거든요. Very old. 어 그들의 그분들의 죽음이 가까이 왔는데 어떻게 제가 그걸 맞이할지 아직 당황스러운 것 같아요. When somebody's parents become old, then we really feel a little bit tight inside for two reasons. One, we cannot stop that in their case. They will keep getting old and we know they will depart. The second reason is that we feel the same about ourselves, that we are getting old and one day we will depart. Distinguish between the two. So don't feel sorry for yourself, but help your parents because uh, it's the nature of our human lives that we are born, we <clears throat> grow up, get old and die. And uh, you can always give your parents what they need, but you can never give them what they want. If what they want and what they need coincide, then there is a happier life. But if it's drastically different, then one lives in the world of illusion rather than in the world of reality. And that's suffering by itself, not just being impermanent and bound to causes and conditions. So love your parents as much as you can, but do not think that you can make them 100% happy. Because what they want and what they need, they will never 100% coincide. But you can always say, Mother, Father, I do this sincerely and wholeheartedly for you. And I apologize if it's not enough. But it will not be enough. 
at some point they will say you're a good daughter or you have done this well. But do not expect perfect results from anyone, including your parents. They can never acknowledge you 100%. Why? Because besides being impermanent and interdependent, we are imperfect. Is the three I's impermanent, imperfect, and interdependent life and death, the way we exist. And if we come to terms with this, we can do our best, but never expect 100% result or a complete appreciation. So do what you can and know your limits. You cannot make them live forever. You cannot bring them perfect health. You cannot live to their utmost satisfaction. And once you have come to terms with that, once you have acknowledged that limitation, then you can act. It's very strange and paradoxical that by acknowledging our limitations, we become more free. More freedom comes if we acknowledge our limitations because we know the exact truth, the footing, where we are. And then we can choose to go beyond them or not. But once you see those limitations as they are, you will not fool yourself into trying to make them live forever when they cannot. Or you're trying to be a perfect daughter and prove to your mother which you cannot. Okay? So, that helps us being ourselves. Our true selves. And that helps us help our parents and friends and everybody who needs that and accepts that. Acknowledging these limitations help us come back to truth. And in this truth, there is a potential. You can always find that. And when I spoke about the difference between repetition and creation, you can harmonize these two because, yes, we repeat the same kind of life as all human beings on earth, but we will never be the same individuals as anyone else. You will never be the same daughter as any of your siblings might be. Your parents will always be who they are. They are never like any other parent. So that relationship is very precious and very particular. Only you know it in your own heart how you relate to your parents. And if that relationship is clear and loving, then when it's time to say goodbyes, there will be no remorse and regret. We can regret that we depart, but when we get old, it may not be such a big stress that we have to go and when we are alive we, we should also acknowledge that when it's time to end something it may not be so bad that we end it and we shouldn't feel sorry because we cannot do something which cannot be done anyway our lives cannot last forever fortunately but sometimes we go before we are supposed to, and that's very unfortunate. The question is, have we fulfilled our relationships as sons, daughters, and parents? Have we done what we were supposed to do? Have we finished that relationship? And then, it's complete. And when it's complete, we can say thank you and go. So ladies and gentlemen, I believe that this Dharma talk today has come to a completion it doesn't mean it was the last, at least I hope, that this wasn't the last time that I was able to speak with you and have the honor that you paid attention to what I had to say. So I hope that in the future we can come together again, share the Dharma again, and make another step towards complete awakening together. Thank you very much.